might turn to Revelation, the 15th chapter. I'm going to start a sermon on the Song of Moses. And uh, by start, at least at this point, I'm not quite sure just how many sermons this will take, but I think it's important enough that we make a rather detailed Bible study of the Song of Moses. Revelation 15 And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I want to read that verse in two other translations, so that when before we get into the Song of Moses, you will understand that this thing that John saw here in Revelation 15 is the finality of this age. Now the King James says of these seven last plagues, In them is filled up the wrath of God. Now the New English Bible, the New Testament, translate this. Then I saw another great and astonishing portent in heaven, seven angels with seven plagues, the last plagues of all. For with them the wrath of God is consummated. And then Ferrar Fenton has uh, Revelation 15.1. Then I saw another sign in the heaven, great and wonderful, seven angels having the seven last plagues, in which the anger of God will be completed. So you see these translations, all of them taken together, make it very plain that the seven last plagues, once they are completed, that is the end of the wrath of God. So what follows of necessity must be the kingdom of God upon the earth, as we'll see in the next few verses. The King James, by using the term is filled up the wrath of God, doesn't show this in the finality as the others do. That's why I wanted to read them. John goes on telling about what he saw in this vision. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Now, most Christian people, New Testament Christians, fundamentalists, or whatever they would call themselves, would recognize that the second verse must be talking about pure, dedicated Christians. You notice these people he sees have gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. And the previous two chapters in Revelation, of course, have quite a bit to say about the mark of the beast and so on. That's not our subject in this sermon, but I want to make it plain that this verse implies these are definitely Christians. They're not professing Christians. They're not uh, false Christians. What he sees are those who have actually gotten the victory. In the first few chapters of Revelation, they would be called the overcomers. And here's what he sees them doing, verse 3 and 4. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying. And then the last part of these two verses is a capsule form of what they're singing. And we're going to go back into the Bible and find out more about the song of Moses. But they're singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest, or thy judgments are made known. So these people are singing a song which in effect outlines, first of all, praise to God, only God is holy, you will rule in a kingdom upon the earth. In other words, they say, All nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Verse 5, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles, And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till or until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. 
Now, whatever this is, it's very obviously he's talking about a series of things that would happen upon the earth called the seven last plagues. During that time, no man would be able to enter this temple that John saw, but also during that time he would see the servants of God, the saints, as it were, the overcomers, singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, saying, and then as we read that you recognize, the thing that they were saying was that God would rule in a kingdom. Now there's more to this um, in this study. We could go right on in Revelation, but I'll just remind you that in the next chapters, Revelation 16 then talks about the false beast and the false prophet and so on, gathering all the nations to the battle in the place called Armageddon. Then Babylon comes in remembrance before God. Then Revelation 17 and 18 is a description of the fall of Babylon. Revelation 19 is a description of the return of Christ. And then 20, 21, and 22 is a description of the New Jerusalem, the Bride of the Lamb, or what we would call the Kingdom of God upon the earth. So what this vision of John's is, I believe must be a period of time during the last plagues, but prior to the kingdom. And the thing that he saw the saints doing was singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Now, our Bible study here primarily has to do with the song of Moses because I'm going to take as an assumption that most people are comparatively familiar with the song of the Lamb. The main part of the preaching in America today is the gospel of salvation, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But how much preaching have you ever heard on the song of Moses? And yet these overcomers, saints of God, singing right before the end of the age, are doing that, and John saw, of course, them doing that in vision, which included the singing of all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. All right, turn with me over to Deuteronomy 31. The Song of Moses starts in the 32nd chapter. We will get into it perhaps just a little way today. But I want you to understand the basis for the Song of Moses, what had happened before it, and why we have such a thing called the Song of Moses. Because I believe that the time for God's Israel people to know the message that's in the Song of Moses is now. I think that time is now. I don't think our people to any great extent have ever understood the Song of Moses in any past uh, centuries during this age. All right, in the 31st chapter, Moses has completed giving the law to Israel. And then we read in verse 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud, and the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. What a sad message this must have been for Moses. Just imagine. Moses had forsaken the flesh pots and the glory of Egypt, had left Egypt, apparently had lived close to 40 years in the desert, then had been called back by God, delivered Israel out of Egypt with these tremendous miracles and the show of the power of God went through the whole ceremony of marrying Israel to God Almighty so that Israel became the bride of the great Jehovah, gave them the law, led them for 40 years in the wilderness during which time he instructed them in the law, had just <coughs> finished giving them the law and God says, Moses, all right, you're ready to die Israel is going to leave me and go whoring after other gods. What a terrible message that was given, or at least looking at it from a human standpoint, what a terrible message God had to give to Moses and Joshua as he called them 
into the tabernacle. All right, let's go on. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? The evils that were going to come upon the Israel people for forsaking God were going to be so terrible that they would finally say, well, these things are here because God's not with us. Now, uh, I want you to think with me of what happened to them in old Canaan land, what has happened to our people all down through history, and you'll see the definite comparison to us today as we go along. And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evil which they shall have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods, now therefore, in other words, because of this, Moses, because of all the things I've done, and they're still going to turn from me, because of this, write ye this song for you, and teach it, the children of Israel, put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. God said, all right. Moses, I know what's going to happen to these people. I know the end from the beginning. I know they're going to turn away. Now Moses, very probably, at least thinking from a human standpoint, had great hopes for the children of Israel. He knew he couldn't go into the promised land. But he knew that Joshua was going to lead them. They had been instructed for 40 years. God had fed them. According to the scriptures, their clothes didn't even get old and they didn't wear out their shoes. Just think of the situation. And then God says, I know it, but they're going to turn and they're going to go worship other gods. Now I want you to write this song because this song is going to be a witness for me against the children of Israel, not for the children of Israel. And you think of this, it will be mentioned in here several times. Against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers that floweth with milk and honey... And they shall have eaten and filled themselves in wax and fat. Then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness. Now you notice God doesn't say that this song is going to be something that Israel is going to know and use all of the time. He says, when they get in trouble, bad trouble, because of their evil, then this song is going to be used for them as a witness. They're going to be actually turned away to other gods, they're going to serve other gods, and they'll break my covenant, then this song will be there for a witness. Now those of us who know the Israelite identity recognize that one of the things that we have done as a people, we have broken God's covenant. To some extent, we've broken it by denying that it exists. We actually deny that we, or God, has a covenant with us. We despise the blood of the covenant because we despise even our own identity. As I mentioned, uh, talking about this pastor up in Springfield, I believe that he's one of a thousand. I believe he is one of the very few ministers in the country who would actually turn around and come back and honor the covenant God made with the house of Israel. We've seen this during the last many years. Other preachers have had an opportunity to talk to men just like I did with this one and very little or no results or even if they would admit that we're Israel, they never teach it. And God says, all right, when you get in this position and then evils and troubles come upon you, then this song shall testify against them as a witness. And remember now, this song, which we're going to read in Deuteronomy 32, is here. This is 3,000 years later, and it's here in the Bible, in which there are millions of copies, and I wonder how few Christian people even know the Song of Moses is in here. But it's here for a witness against Israel, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouth of their seed, for I know their imagination which they go about even now, 
before I have brought them into the land which I swear. They weren't even in there yet, and God already knew. He knew the end from the beginning. He knew what they were going to do wrong. Moses, therefore, wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. And I should make a remark about the last part of that verse 21. Because I believe if there is any one error being taught by Christian Israel identity ministers, it's the error of exalting Israel. It is the error of exalting Israel. Some of you people know that when we first came to Phoenix to begin this ministry, we weren't here 60 days, and we had as many people then as we have in this meeting right today. But almost all of the people that came to my ministry immediately left within six months, and they left for one reason. I refused to castigate the Jews for sermon after sermon after sermon, and that's all they wanted to hear. There are ministers who preach the Israel identity, who try to exalt us because we're Israelites by downgrading the enemies of Israel. And here we have our forefathers, and by the way, we're the children of these fathers. We're the descendants, we're just like them. And God says of them, after this 40 years of miracle after miracle after miracle, he says of them, I know their imagination which they go about even now before I have brought them into the land which I swear. What was in their minds? Well, evil, wicked, sinful thoughts, just like are in our minds, are people just like us. They were already thinking of the things that they would be doing, things that would be against God before they ever even got into Canaan land. Isn't much to say about the house of Israel, is it? They're not such great people, are they? After all. And I know I get literature from some of the Israel identity ministers and you would read it and you would think that we're the greatest bunch of people who ever lived upon the face of the earth. Well, brother, sister, I don't deny that we have a lot of intelligence and we seem to have a certain moral stamina which is missing in other people. But, brother, sister, I'll tell you something else. That Israel, without the word of God, can become the most filthy, degraded people upon the face of this earth. And that's what you're seeing in America today. You're seeing Israel without the Word of God. And there's nothing that you can exalt about Israel and the Israelites at all. They're that bad that God said, All right, I know they're going away from me and they're actually going to worship other gods already even then. And I need this song. I want you to write this song, Moses, so when they get in trouble, you're going to have a witness. I am going to have a witness against them. I want to read just a couple of verses in Isaiah 2 about who will be exalted in the end of the age. You know this is a prophecy in verse 2 of the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and so on. But in verse 10 I read, Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. No exaltation of Israel in that day, is there? And just in case you missed it, he put it down in verse 17 again. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. I do not deny that Israel is a chosen vessel. But Israel is not going to be exalted in the day of the Lord. And I can't emphasize this too strongly because apparently many people, when they first find out some of these things about who we are, our identity as Israel and so on, they tend to say, well, that's the reason why we're so good. No, it isn't at all, brother. It's a reason why we should turn to God and read his word and try to be a little bit good from the filthiness that we have without God. I should have inserted here a turn back to Deuteronomy 31, verse 22. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge and said, 
Be strong and of good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. And it came to pass, when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book, until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law, and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. So you see, the law, the law of God is also a witness against Israel. And he said, you put it in the ark, so it will be there as a witness against thee. For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against the Lord, and how much more after my death. So you see, Moses apparently had some idea himself that Israel hadn't done too badly during the last 30-some years after they'd been straightened out a half a dozen times in the beginning of the 40 years. They hadn't done too badly, and he said, you've been fairly good during my life, but I know you're going to turn. So now we have the law put in there as a witness against Israel, and the Song of Moses is going to be a witness against Israel. There's nothing in the Bible that is a witness against God. But Israel now has two witnesses against them. And I want to read a little bit out of God's law so you'll see why this was done. Turn over to Deuteronomy 17. We'll start reading in verse 2. This is the law. This is God's law. If there be found among you within any of thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman, that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or the moon, or any of the host of heaven which I have not commanded. And you'll notice we read in Deuteronomy 31 that Israel would do this. Now we're reading the law as to what is done when people do this. If they worship these other gods, and so on, verse 4, And it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing certain, that such abomination is wrought in Israel, after you make the investigation, and you find that this person is worshiping other gods, then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman, which hath committed that wicked thing, unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shall stone them with stones still till they die. Any Israelite is under the death penalty from God Almighty from turning away from him and worshiping other gods or the stars or the host of heaven. And and the law states they are to be put to death by stoning. And then he says in verse 6, At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death, death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. God Almighty never breaks his own divine law. Israel is under sentence of death, but Israel has to have the testimony of two witnesses against them to convict them of the sin that God said they would commit. The law is one and the Song of Moses is the other. The two witnesses that place Israel under divine judgment of death is the law of God, which is in the ark as a testimony and a witness against them, and the Song of Moses, which is a witness against them. Now, as we go on here, I'm going to make this plain that I believe that Israel as a people cannot come under the conviction of death until both witnesses have spoken. Now you know that I and most of the other ministers preach quite a bit out of the law of God in order to show the sins of Israel and our people. Paul said of himself that he would not have known sin except by the law. Paul had to hear and understand the law before he recognized what he was doing wrong. Sin is transgression of the law. But if you don't know the law, you don't know what your sin is. But God requires two witnesses for anyone to be put to death. 
we have had preached now for some years the law to the house of Israel. And I believe it will be continued to preach. And as people recognize it, they will see that this law is a witness which convicts us of sin, transgression of the law, and we are under the judgment of God to be put to death. But Israel will not recognize as a people this judgment until they also hear the testimony of the second witness. And that's the Song of Moses. And the overcomers, the people who were singing at the end of the age, while the seven last plagues had to take out their course to finish the judgment of God upon the earth, they sang the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb, or the Song of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's go to Acts 7 and verse 44. In referring to the things that the fathers did, the writer here says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. This is what it's called. Remember, the law was in the ark, therefore... It was called the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. And we read in Revelation 15, in verse 5, after he hears these people singing, then John also sees, and after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And what I believe we're seeing is the two witnesses against Israel are now being opened and read and proclaimed to the house of Israel. And we can preach the law to Israel, which is a witness, but we could preach it from now till doomsday. But if we okay. don't preach and teach the second witness, the Song of Moses, Israel will not turn. Now, I'm not saying that Emory is the only preacher that knows anything about the Song of Moses. I'm sure that there are many others. But I'm sure that many people have not recognized the importance of it as the second witness against Israel before God Almighty for the conviction and the judgment of death. Now, I don't have to tell you people, we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. We have been redeemed from death. But in order to be redeemed from death, we have to recognize we are under death. And Paul does this in the New Testament. The preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ shows us that we are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And we're under sentence of death. And what we're doing now is putting the song of Moses in the hearts and the lips of these overcomers so that they can sing the song of Moses while the seven plagues run their course. All right, let's read on in Deuteronomy 31. The law is one witness. The Song of Moses is the other. And then verse 28, Moses keeps talking to the people. Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. Now you'll notice... As Moses does this, he said, All right, I call two witnesses too. I call heaven and earth to record that I'm going to give you this song of Moses. God does everything with two witnesses. For I know that after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days. What about that? Everything that we've been reading up here so far, and what we're going to read in Deuteronomy 32, is a preparation for the evil that will fall upon Israel in the latter days. And I believe that, e that evil, of course, is the seven plagues that are in Revelation 16 that will come upon the house of Israel because of their sins, and this is what this whole Song of Moses is for, to be sung during those seven plagues. Evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. And then he starts out the very next verse of the song, as the actual song comes to Israel itself, Give ear, O ye heavens, 
and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Notice that this song of Moses is so important to the house of Israel that Moses twice calls the heavens and the earth to be witnesses that he does give it to the house of Israel. Isn't it strange that in this end of the age when we have multiplied millions of professing Christians, thousands upon thousands of ministers who preach hundreds of thousands of sermons and write hundreds of books which they distribute millions of copies of, and you never hear them talk about the Song of Moses. Not a word. I don't recall myself, perhaps some of the rest of you may, ever hearing from a Pentecostal preacher or a fundamentalist preacher or an evangelist one single word about the Song of Moses. And yet the overcomers in Revelation 15 are seen by, seen by John as singing the Song of Moses. Well, you can't sing a song unless someone teaches it to you, can you? Or unless you know it. So apparently, the overcomers in Revelation 15 have to learn the Song of Moses before they can sing it during the time of those seven last plagues. And, Mo and Moses goes to the trouble of twice calling heaven and earth to witness that he gave it to the house of Israel. Now, I want to make one comment before we read the first few verses of this. It's pretty hard to convince the present house of Israel that this song is for them until you also convince them they're the house of Israel, right? So don't misunderstand me. I do not mean to downgrade the teaching of our identity. It must be taught. Israel must be convinced they are Israel, and then they will be open for being taught the Song of Moses and understand it so that Israel can actually sing it. All right, let's read on in Deuteronomy 32. Heaven and earth has been called. Verse 2, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God, He is the Rock. He is the Rock. Who is the God of creation and the God of Israel? The Lord Jesus Christ. Brother, sister, if we could just get that thought across to these people... You see, the beginning of the Song of Moses starts out with praise of God, but it immediately identifies God as Jesus Christ. And these foolish preachers that have the idea that the Jews can worship the Jehovah of the Old Testament are absolutely and totally in error. I am, think that some of them are in error to the extent that I would actually call them the ministers of Satan. It is totally false. The very beginning of the Song of Moses says he is the rock, and I suppose I better turn and read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, in case some of my New Testament Christians don't know what I'm talking about. Paul is writing to the Christians at Corinth. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers... How about that? The fathers of the Christians at Corinth? Of course they were. They were Israelites at Corinth. How all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock, capitalized, that followed them and that rock was Christ. Jesus Christ came out of Egypt with the house of Israel. Jesus Christ is the God of Israel, and brother and sister, it is more true and scriptural to say that God brought Christians out of Egypt than it is that he brought Jews, because Christ was with them. Christ was with them. All right. He says, I will publish the name of the Lord, describe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. He is Jesus Christ. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. 
And then he says of them. Now remember what he said of God. God is just and right. There's no flaw in him. There's no sin. Nothing was ever found of sin in the Lord Jesus Christ. But they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Israel, is this what you give back to God for what God has given you? God has done all of these tremendous things of bringing you out of the house of bondage. He has stayed with you all of these centuries, millenniums now, and has given you all these great and wonderful things, and you turn and be evil and turn to other gods. Is this what you give God back for God being with you? You see how the very beginning of the Song of Moses and the rest of it will show you that there is no good thing in us. There is nothing in this body or this person or this mind or anything that can be exalted in any way, shape, or manner. And until Israel comes to a realization that they are totally evil, that they are totally lost, that they are totally in sin, Israel will never repent and come to God in the manner that they must before the kingdom. The bride must make herself ready. All right, let's read just a few more on here. Do you thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath not he made thee and established thee? And then he says, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, ask thy father, and he will show thee, thy elders, and they will tell thee, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel, for the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. You can't read nine verses, even seven verses, in the Song of Moses until you have to come up with one thing. God chose Israel. God chose Israel. And you cannot preach the Song of Moses. You cannot believe it. You cannot sing it until you recognize that God is omnipotent and just. We are degraded and children of the dust. But God chose Israel. Now next time, Lord willing, we're going to go right on in the Song of Moses. And I believe that you will see that the words in this song can be the most powerful witness against the house of Israel to bring them to an understanding of what God has done in buying them. That's the question. Is it not he that has bought thee? And redeeming them from the hands of their enemies of any other portion of Scripture that we need in this end of the age. So you bear with me. It may take several sermons, but we'll use the time. Let's all stand. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this double witness that thou hast given us. And Lord, we pray that as you open up this word, that it will be preached all across this land to this thy people. God help us for returning to thee such an evil heart after the things that thou hast done for thy people. God be with us. Help us. Speed the end of this age, Lord, that we may see and know thee in thy kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.